all it takes is one person to ruin a meeting or ruin a day. The reason we love people like Warren Buffett and others like that is because they have such clarity of thought. Like for me, connections are the doors to opportunities. My best opportunities in business have come from relationships. You cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. All right. Today on the podcast, I have my amazing CEO, Jonathan, on to go through what might be uh, pound for pound or word for word, one of the better blog posts I've, I've ever written. I love ones that are super short like this, um, but also are, are very impactful. So it's uh, the Sam Altman blog post, What I Wish Someone Had Told Me. Um, the Jonathan, I think I read this one in like 45 seconds. I don't know how quick you went through it, but I read it. And then I was like, I need to reread this about 30 times to process it. Yeah. In terms of like value, value per second read, I think this is definitely one of the highest of all time. Um, easy read and ridiculously packed with, um, useful, uh, bits of wisdom that you'll surely revisit. So it's definitely worth the read for anyone. That's for sure. Yeah. I feel like Sam Altman with this post and then Naval with his tweets, they are like in like the the 1% of word for word, like the most impactful advice givers on uh, the internet or Twitter sphere. Yeah, I'm realizing that the fewer words used, oftentimes the better it is because it's been distilled down to its essence. There's no fluff there. So I, I usually, I'm starting to use that as an indicator that you know, um, that it's actually worth reading. But if it's short, it's it's good. It's worth reading. It's worth bookmarking, whatever. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, it kind of goes to from this executive coach that I've been speaking with. There's like two pieces of advice. One is speak last, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, you want to hear what everyone says process and then be the definitive voice if you're one of the higher people in the room. And the second is brevity is a superpower. And I think it's sure. easy to ramble, right? It's like the quote, it's like, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. And I think <laughs> brevity yeah. is, is a superpower that I, I need to perfect. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, but yeah, this is definitely a must read. I'm so happy we're going into it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So before we dive in, will you explain to people who is this Sam Altman guy that is in all the headlines that is all of a sudden, you know, the, the guy running probably one of the most, the fastest growing companies in the world. You know, funny thing is even I'm a little surprised that he's, he's where he's at right now, because I remember um, he first came um, to my attention when I was closely following Y Combinator and they were the, the it incubator for startups, raising money in the world. And uh, he became the CEO of Y Combinator. He was the CEO of Y Combinator right after Paul Graham resigned, if I'm not mistaken, or stepped out. So he was the first uh, non-founder CEO of Y Combinator. And uh, he always gave interesting insights, uh, was very open to sharing his, his wisdom and gave his uh, playbook on how to succeed to other founders because I believe he had a startup that he had that was acquired by another company. I think it was called Looped is his startup. I don't, I'm not sure who acquired it, maybe Google or someone else, but uh, that's the early story I remember of him. And then he disappeared for a while Y Combinator fell into someone else's hands. I think it was Michael Seibel or something like that. And then years later, uh, he came back as the founder of OpenAI, which, which I feel was probably the smartest move someone's ever done um, for something that he wasn't necessarily involved in founding. So, but anyway, that's a different story. Really smart guy. He's been around and he knows what he's talking about. So definitely worth listening to. Yeah. And all of a sudden there'll be an announcement like, oh, Sam Altman bought this like island or he made this investment in a company. And the investment isn't like an angel round. He's putting in like $50 million. And you're just like, geez, th this guy has has slowly built up a, a really impressive fortune. And there, there's two quotes Paul Graham has about him that are are pretty impressive. And Paul Graham is the guy who started Y Combinator, as you mentioned. He said this one, he goes, you could parachute him into an island full of cannibals and come back in five years and he'd be king. 
And you're just like, oh my gosh. And then he said another one when he was talking to Sam Altman early in his career. And he was hearing Sam Altman talk. He goes, oh, I remember thinking, ah, this is what it must, what Bill Gates must have been like when he was 19. I mean, those are some impressive compliments. And with the uh, the board shakeup he had at OpenAI where they ousted him and then he came back, it kind of proved his quote right of he survived on an island of cannibals. That was an insane four day run of just like watching this unfold on Twitter of him being out of open AI and then being back, but um, super impressive dude. Yeah. He strikes me as someone who's like probably the best, um, you know, like there's lifestyle design in terms of career design and hacking and being in the right place at the right time uh, and being in the right opportunity vehicle at the right time, which is now AI. Um, he's definitely done that better than anyone else actually I can think of from, um, in terms of where he's at from where he started. So totally agree with Paul Graham. Uh, it's fascinating though. Yeah. So he'll, um, he'll come out with a blog post every now and then that is just a, a, a rainmaker. We did a, a podcast, shoot, that was last year or maybe two years ago on one of his um, really iconic blog posts, which was how to be successful. Is that what it was called, Jonathan? I believe so. Yes. How to be successful. Yeah. And that was published back in 2019, by the way, and um, has over 2 million views. So that's quite uh, a popular blog. Yeah, it, it's good. It's it's one of those blog posts you want to read and reread again. So he came out with this one, what I wish someone had told me. And it's literally just 17 items. He lists them. And we'll put the link in the podcast. Just read it. You should actually pause and go read it real quick. And then we're, Jonathan and I wanted to um, expand on it. And I think we both have like seven or nine that really resonated. But Jonathan, I'll let you start. Which one got your attention that, that you're like, oh, shoot, that that nailed it. Yeah, I, you know, funny thing is I've been saying this one to you for quite a while uh, and many other people for that matter. Like it's easier for a team to do the hard thing that matters more than to do an easy thing that doesn't matter. Audacious ideas motivate people. Uh, and I believe that the sweat's the same. It's the same number of hours a day that are dedicated to whatever work is being done. Um, like who is it? I, I don't know who exactly. I think maybe Warren Buffett was talking about like, person who owns and operates a restaurant probably works the same as as you know someone who's investing billions but the the upside and the reward for if you're in the right uh, opportunity vehicle is so much more it's more it's easier to attract the right people easier to attract capital easier to stay motivated for the entire journey so the so it's like you have no downside if you're going to struggle the same why not pick something that's going to reward you more and I've always felt this was the case. It actually makes sense for him in his uh, life experience. He's working on an idea that seems so, you know, futuristic as probably going to be the most important discovery or not discovery, but like step forward for humanity since the, you know, discovery of electricity. And he's found the right opportunity vehicle to get him there. It motivates the people around him, uh, makes him successful. If he's going to work, why not work on the thing that really matters? And I think it's easily captured in in that uh, that third point that that's on his blog and worth rereading multiple times. Yeah, and the big thing is like do a hard thing that matters as opposed to an easy thing that doesn't matter because yeah. the easy thing if it doesn't matter you're going to lose steam you're not going to be able to recruit people and it it just won't last when you play the long game but if you go after something that matters like people that are a players people that are passionate or really ambitious they're they're going to follow you to that because if i'm like Jonathan, let's go open the best deli shop down the street we're going to use the same ingredients as all the other ones but we're going to we're going to open it like that's going to be hard to get you to to do that but if i'm like hey let's go acquire 50 companies and let's try and spin out and, and like build this AI SaaS that is around what you're really good at. It's going to be hard, but it, it could be huge. You're going to be more inclined for, for that second one. And I think he is someone that is really good at kind of mobilizing and motivating people. Hence what he's freaking doing with open AI. And now he's trying to build um, his own chip manufacturer where he's raising trillions of dollars. So he's definitely um, putting his money where his mouth is on this one. Yeah. What's your, what's the first one for you, Jim? You know, I'm actually going with number one. Um, he says optimism, optimism, obsession, self-belief, raw horsepower, and personal connections are how to get started. And 
it's so true is that there's this quote, it's like pessimists um, will um, often be right, but they'll never be happy. Whereas optimists can be <laughs> wrong, but eventually will find their way to be happy. And I, I think about that whenever you're starting something from scratch, it's like, you've got to be optimist. You've got an optimist. You've got to be obsessed. And he said raw, raw horsepower. That's actually my favorite keyword within this line. Because if you're trying to recruit someone in the early days, I don't think we analyze this enough. It's like, what is their horsepower? Because I, I like even when you and I started working together, you worked for free just to test if we should work well together. And you would go away on a weekend and come back and be like, oh, I, I re like uh, wrote the decks for how we sell CRO. Oh, I like transform the onboarding process. And that all happened within two weeks. And you're just like, this dude has a different motor and runs at a different pace. We've, we've got a few people like that on our team where you're like, man, I I hope everybody else sees that. So that, that key word of horsepower stuck out. And then the final one on personal connections are how things get started. Like for me, connections are the doors to opportunities. As much as I hate the word networking, I do like relationships and my best opportunities in business have come from relationships. And so I like how we led with when you're starting something, those are the the key traits. So th those really resonated. Yeah. You know, now that you've, you've said that you've, you've broken that down, it makes a lot more sense for whatever reason, though, initial read, I kind of skipped through that one. Uh, I wasn't the one that, um, that lit me up, but um, my second one actually is my favorite one on all, in all, in the entire article is that incentives are superpowers set them carefully. Um, you know, I actually believe that the next big thing that someone really hasn't written a book on or hasn't started a movement on is in incentives. You have James Clear with habits and many other people with different keywords and things that, but incentives is still that, you know, that unconquered territory. And I think the closest book that comes to this actually is uh, Influence and actually a few other books by the same author, Robert Caldini like persuasion and things like that. There are a few behavioral economists that have written about incentives, but no one is really like, no one has incentives in their, you know, in, in their book title. And I feel that's a huge, um, huge, huge, huge topic. Um, like if you have kids, nieces, nephews, or anyone like, or any family member, you don't even have to have a big room. So you'll, you'll realize the importance of incentives and how powerful it is. I remember there's a story, um, Charlie Munger was so deeply moved by the book Influence by that, that author I mentioned earlier that he rewarded him shares in Berkshire Hathaway. And he's the only person that wow. Charlie Munger has ever rewarded shares um, to. So it's that important uh, that it's 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 a game changer how you manage not only yourself, but other people. Um, and it's uh, it's definitely powerful. Absolutely. So I'm right, glad we, you we need to here. stop the podcast right now. I think you need yeah. to be the incentives guy, right? Like Matt McGarry's <laughs> the newsletter guy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Justin Welsh is the solopreneur guy. You need yeah. to be the incentives guy. You know how Alex uh, Hermosi launched million dollar offer, million dollar incentives. Yeah. Let's go with this. Um, <laughs> let's let's. And I think you curate all of the great works of incentives over time. You create your own framework because what if we ran our business where everyone was compensated based on incentives that motivate them personally, professionally, or motivationally? Because I see it, man, even with my kids, like they want new toys all the time. I'm like, that's it. No more new toys. Like if you want toys, you've got to earn money. And my daughter comes up to me. She's like, dad, if I clean the whole upstairs, would you give me five bucks? And I was like, absolutely. She was quickly like, how about 20 bucks? I'm like, no, $5 is the, is the limit. But it's, um, I, I know what moves her. I know the, the incentives now, but um, okay, dude, let's, you should be the incentives guy. Why don't we do this? Yeah, I'm actually going to start studying this topic in greater depth. And not, not yeah. even so much like, who knows if, if, if I ever decide to do that, but it gives you an unfair advantage when it comes to dealing with other people in the world. Uh, it's a really, really powerful tool in the, you know, whenever I've used it in life. So definitely mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. All right. I, I, we almost need to do a whole side tangent on that. So that one was really good. Um, the one um, I definitely had your one on three on um, choosing the hard thing. Cause, and the other comment I want to put on that is like idea selection matters or problem that you're solving or the question you're solving matters. I think a lot of people don't put enough time on that. 
Um, the other one I wanted to put is uh, co number two, cohesive teams, the right combination of calmness and urgency and unreasonable commitment are how things get finished. Long-term orientation is in short supply. Try not to worry about what people think in the short term, which will get easier over time, right? And so it kind of goes back to my point on pace. When he says the combination of calmness and urgency, um, I, I love that where it's like, I, I heard this thing around, you know, you want to have, uh, it, it was actually from Frank Slootman, where he is the CEO of Snowflake, who just stepped down, who wrote the blog post. Um, oh, shoot. What was it called? Um, let me pause to look it up. Do you know which one I'm talking about, Frank Slootman? Um, Aha, amp it up. Um, he has oh, yeah. this idea of um, unreasonable expectations, where he wants people to pick up the pace. And that's something that I'm like, man, if if we try to compress what you could do in a year, in a quarter, imagine what we could do if that compounds. And having the right team that has that long-term view but works at pace is where you get things really accomplished. I think that's something you and I are always trying to do with the, the different launches. So I, I really liked number two. Yeah, that's interesting. Like amp it up. I, I know we've discussed like 12, hour, it was a 12 week year in terms of like cramming an entire 12 month year into 12 weeks and having four of those in one year. So you have four, four, four years in a typical year. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I'll actually go with my third one here, Jim, that really st stood out to me, which is communicate clearly and concisely. I don't know why, but I think as I, as I'm aging, I'm starting to really appreciate the, the power of the written word and the ability to simplify and like very concisely lay out your points. That's the reason why we're, we're doing this podcast on this post is because it's, it's concise, it's clear, it's, con it's, it's, it's very easy to understand and take action on. And as we're working with our team, I think this is one thing that I'm coaching people on is like, how do you communicate um, to a busy executive, right? Someone who doesn't have the time and the attention to, to like really understand what you're trying to say. And I think this is really a superpower. If you can, if you can persuade people with the written word, it's, it's, it's really powerful. And I'm glad he has it here as, as some of the, like one of the big realizations in his, in his work life. How do you think, I had this one too, how do you become better at being a clear communicator that is concise? For me, I was thinking through, and I, I really think it's about reps. It's about getting reps, writing more and reading more. I find that when I journal in the morning and I write out my thoughts, I'm so much more thoughtful and intentional with the day. Um, that's one thing I think through. The other thing I think through is uh, be quick to listen and slow to speak. That way, every word you use is thoughtful and intentional. And those are things that I've been thinking through a lot on how to be a better communicator. I have the best answer for you, actually. Uh, I was listening <laughs> to podcasts this weekend uh, when I was driving um the what's it called my first million they they had a workshop actually walking through the power of the written word and essentially walking you through the steps of how to be a good writer and it occurred to me and I, I kind of already knew this but writing is actually thinking if you think about it right it's like the quality of your writing is a direct reflection of the quality of your thinking um and the reason we love people like Warren Buffett and others like that is because they have such clarity of thought that it just comes screaming out in their words um, and if you start thinking of writing as a thinking exercise, it's, it's different. Like they say how, like he was given an example of how, like when he writes copy for product launches or something like that, he, he uses his writing, uh, as more of a brain dump and he doesn't even know what he's going to say at the end. And it's like, as you're going through the exercise of writing, it will help you think and help you come up with ideas that you initially wouldn't have. You otherwise wouldn't have come up with. So it's it's a way to almost uh, how should I say like pull ideas out of you, and then at the end the organizing it like doing the wordsmithing and polishing it is the easy last part. It's the final mile, but the initial bulk of the writing exercise is really just thinking, putting things down, and then you know as as you go through you you will organize and, and come up with it. And he said this interesting thing as well as like before writing, understanding what are the emotions you're trying to solicit from the other person. And they're like, they're like these three letter uh, words like, wow, um, aha, uh, what's the other one? Um, what the fuck, uh, WTF, and a few others, like these are the emotions that you want the person to get. And then you're almost working backwards from the emotion that the person's supposed to have. 
Uh, and then when you have that in mind, it's much easier to kind of craft your words and, and your thoughts accordingly. But uh, if you have time, definitely check out that podcast. I thought it was really a master class at writing clearly and concisely for whatever purpose, whether it's for work or a sales page or whatever, or to persuade people for whatever reason, I think it's definitely uh, worth a listen. Okay, I'll check that out. But yeah, I need to increase my my volume of writing for sure, or my, my frequency. Of yeah, um, and, and one last point on that, actually. And there's a reason why Jeff Bezos forces everyone at Amazon to write memos instead of PowerPoints. PowerPoints hide poor thinking. Writing does not. There's no way to, there's no place to hide um, in, in prose. So it's definitely a thinking exercise if you think about it. You're motivating me with our sales decks that are very guilty of that. I'm, I might write them as like a brief and then try and turn them into slides as opposed to just putting up these pretty slide decks where it's like, oh, look at our service. Um, okay, tangent done. The one that I have next is number 10. Superstars are even more valuable, valuable than they seem, seem, but you have to evaluate people on their net impact on the performance of the organization. And I, I totally agree with this. And like with growth hit, our biggest inflection points have come with hiring superstars. Like before you came along, I was just treading water, water trying not to drown. We were not going to hit seven figures because I'm just trying to do everything. You came in and were like, hold my beer, step aside. This is how you do CRO the right way and took us up a notch, right? And that's happened with some other key hires in, in the business as well. And it's funny because all of these key hires, they came at a point where I was like, shoot, I don't know if I can afford this person. This is risky. And then three months later, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine my life without that person. And I actually think that sometimes the best growth hack or tactic isn't a channel or a thing. It's a hire. And that's something that I, I don't think people hit on enough. It, it's it's getting that person that is putting rocket fuel on the fire. You know, I picked the same one as well. What stood out to me in this one is very different than what you called out just now. Um, the key phrase in this for me was net impact, because you might find a superstar yeah. that's really like just killer at what they do the best, but net impact could be negative, right? So that's something to be very careful of. Um, you know, like one of our policies is no jerks allowed. If you pull a superstar, it growth it, but the person just makes work life balance and just work experience as a whole miserable for everyone, then their net impact is, you know, is negative. It's, it's really bad, um, on the rest of the team. So it's just something to think about because most people just look at the, you know, the, the fancy CV and the amazing credentials and that person's way of pitching themselves and just, you know, sign on for life. And that's not always the best way. Yeah. No, the, the net impact is a key call out there. Uh, what's the next one that you have? Don't fight the business equivalent of the laws of physics. I love and, that one. Yeah, I love this one too, because um, I can't, I keep forgetting the phrase, but it's like Warren Buffett once said, like, if you take a good manager and you put them in a bad business, the reputation of the bad business will win or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't <laughs> matter how good you are, if your business sucks. I mean, it's like the fundamentals of your business suck. If your unit economics are working against you, if if it doesn't fit the lifestyle that you want for you and your family, then, you know, you're just fighting a lost battle here. So, like, why not, you know, put your linear ladder against the right wall and climb that instead of fighting something that you just can't win? So that's just something that uh, that we've, we've discussed this in the past around the business model of an agency. But, um, you know, there are many other businesses that we've come exposed to that are just they have an unfair advantage there. They, they just, the people that are serving, the needs that they're serving, just everything that's built into that business is just so, so powerful that they have these tailwinds that make life a lot easier for everyone. That that's something that we should definitely, and I think everyone should definitely think about um, as they're pursuing business. Yeah, I love that one. And that one, when, I, when he was saying, you know, the business equivalent of the law of physics, I was like, what are those? And it made me think of Nathan Barry's uh, value of wealth creation ladder and the different businesses that get to certain levels because the agency, it can be a great business, it can cash flow, but it has limitations. It has a lot of things pulling it down from a, a physics level because it only scales as big as your, your workforce gets because people are the leverage. And then we now have an e-commerce company and I'm seeing the, the business physics play out real well right there. It's like, oh, wow, you only have this amount of inventory. 
you're capped on how much revenue you can make. And it's like, oh, here are your margins. You're capped on what you can spend to acquire a customer. And so it's like, you know, the companies that have these levels of physics that can go to a compounding level when you get into technology and SaaS and, and what he's doing with open AI. And it, I kind of married it a little bit with that idea of choosing big ideas that play to the law of business physics that you want to play in. And that's where, where you need to be. But that one, I, I think you don't really realize it until you're in a business where you see those, those um, enablers and the things that, um, stop you from growing to the scale that you might want to hit. You know, there's an interesting story of Alex Ramosi talking about how initially he was getting success just um, building gyms. So I think he'd reached six gyms. He had a chance meeting with uh, Russell Brunson who told him about, you know, your opportunity vehicle here is weak. It's not the right one. And kind of pitched him on the idea of either licensing his business or thinking of something else with so the course sales. And he went from literally running six gyms to then scaling past eight figures shortly thereafter, literally within the first year or something like that right after that. So yeah, the right opportunity, well, just even the right people with the same people, same skill set, but just changing the opportunity vehicle, I think makes the game completely different. Um, so something to think about. Well, who's up, me or you? Is it me? It's your turn, yeah. I can't decide where I'm going to go next. I'm trying to be strategic on one you might not have picked. So I'm going to go, I've got, I think, three more. I'm going with this one. Um, number 11, fast iteration can make up for a lot. It's usually okay to be wrong if you iterate quickly. Plans should be measured in decades. Execution should be measured in weeks. Uh, this is something that I think through a lot. Like we run um, the entrepreneur operating system from the book Traction. We do quarterly rocks. And I think there's two things here. One is, you know, what are we really focusing on? Are we concentrating on it? And what is the time frame in which we expect to re receive results? Because we're a small company. We should be able to move and iterate fast. And that's something I never want to lose sight on. Like we have the long-term vision over 10 years, but I want us to be talking about execution in weeks or in two-week sprints. And um, yeah, th that one really resonated. You know, one thing I'd add to that, actually, and one thing that came to mind as I was reading that is uh, Jeff Bezos' quote around, like, uh, quote around one-way door decisions and two-way door mm. decisions. Um, it's like, if something is trivial, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake. As uh, Sam Altman says, if you're iterating fast, you'll recover. Whereas if it's an important decision, a one-way door decision, you definitely want to take your time and patience. Um, in speed, I don't think is definitely the optimal way to approach those types of questions or decisions. So just wanted to call that out, but um, that's the only thing I would I amend on that one. Um, my, my other one is uh, spend more time recruiting. This is the ninth one, by the way, take risks on high potential people with a fast rate of improvement. And this is the key part, look for evidence of getting stuff done in addition to intelligence, uh, because I've come across a lot of people who are very good, know their stuff, but when it comes to execution and getting stuff done um, or even have a track record, I think that's where um, that's where I've seen people lack. Um, so that's something that I totally agree with. And he called out extremely well on this. No, I, I totally agree on that one. Um, I mean, all of these overlap to, to some extent as far as some of the themes that they have, even this last one, number 15 on compounding, like compounding um, exponentials are magic. In particular, you really want to build a business that gets a compounding advantage with scale. And it's really understanding what you're investing in that can compound. Are you investing in your brand? Are you investing in SEO? Are you investing in a customer list? Um, you know, if it's investments, it's these assets that can compound and having that long-term vision to see where the compounding can have a huge impact is something that you have to have that long-term view to do. You know, I like that you put it that way. When I first read that one, I was initially thinking of like, in terms of compounding, you have to be a big company where, um, you could take advantage of compounding there at that scale. I wasn't necessarily thinking about it. Like if you have a you know, an email list or something like that, something that's more approachable for the for the typical entrepreneur. But that's an interesting take. Um, my last one, Jim, is outcomes count. Don't let good process ex processes excuse bad results. And this is something that I deal with on a regular basis, 
when you love the process that you've built, it works, it produces results. And then at some point, it stops producing the same level of results. You kind of see you're still in love with that and what you've invested the sunk cost of the time you've spent building that, where in fact, you know, it's not delivering the same level of outcomes. It's time to revisit the process as a whole, maybe throw away what you've invested months, sometimes even years into. So that's definitely something that really stood out to me. And I totally agree with it's the outcomes really that, you know, that decide what process to keep or not. Yeah, I um, I was early in my career and I was working for a startup called Urban Daddy where it launched in Dallas. You wrote about all the cool new things going on and I was supposed to get the scoop on this new opening and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. I tried hard. I did all the things they told me to do and I went to the, the manager. I was like, hey, he was in New York. I was on a call. I was like, hey, I can't get it. It's just not going to work. And he goes, don't show me the pain. Show me the baby. Figure it out. And I just remember being like, first F you. And then I was like, you know what? He's right. Like, it doesn't matter that I've like done the process of what they say to do. It's like, just make it happen. And a lot of times we want it to be this perfect process that is streamlined, but business isn't like that. You just have to drag things across the finish line and make it happen. It might not scale. It might not be pretty, but you just need to get that win and then move on to the next thing. And that, that could be very counterintuitive as you think through scaling and it needs to be this this really clean process. So yeah, at the end of the day, it's about outcomes. And it's it's yeah. people that understand that that really move up within the business. Absolutely. Totally agree. What's your what's your last one, Jim? No, I think I've, I've got them all. I mean, the other last one, I, I'll say number 17. Uh, working with great people is one of the best parts of life. I heard a quote on like, who do you do life with? Who do you do business with? And there's people that say, you know, you know, you spend so much time in business, why not do it with your best friends or family or people that you enjoy? I get nervous on that because I never want to let that impact relationships. But I think there is a world where that can play well. Because I mean, there's a reason we have the no jerks policy at growth hit. We spend so much freaking time on Zoom and in Slack. All it takes is one person to ruin a meeting or ruin a day. And by us having a small business, we can really control not having that that person that'll ruin the time. This is a horrible quote that I hear because I'm from Oklahoma, but it's like, don't be the turd in the, the punch bowl or the turd in the pool. <laughs> so you definitely want to avoid that. That's a good one. That's a good way to end, actually. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So good blog post. People need to read it. And then, okay, Jonathan, before we close, let me pitch you an idea that's probably really bad that we should not do, but I'm going to... Put it with two things. One, there is something that we have an unfair advantage to do decently, maybe well, I don't know. And then two, the timing is right. And I would argue that with this idea, timing is the hardest thing with any idea. So you want to take advantage of it when you can, right? It's like, oh, wow, the iPhone launch, let's launch some apps. Oh, well, you can do... Uh, you can track where people are on, like from a geographic standpoint, let's launch Uber. Or while wow, AI is launching, let's stand up some, you know, server farms or whatever that is. And so the thing that has happened is um, Techstar Seattle has closed down. And you and I mentored for Techstars. This past batch, we literally mentored all 24 startups, um, which was exciting. I've been mentoring startups through Techstars since 2016. So Techstars Seattle closed down and there's a, and what is Techstars? It's a startup accelerator. They let in basically 20 to 30 startups a year in Seattle. They give them a little bit of money. They connect them with mentors. They help them validate an idea and grow it and scale it. That has gone away, but Seattle is a massive market. There's a huge startup ecosystem here and there is a gap. What if we launched our own version of a Techstars Seattle startup accelerator? Because we are good at that early phase of validating a startup idea. So I think there's a lot of reasons why this could be a bad idea, but there's also some reasons where, wow, this could be interesting. We let people into our cohort. We give them free growth marketing services. Um, we help them validate their idea in exchange for equity. We get some unicorns and then we're, we're, we're billionaires. Um, let's poke holes. Why is this a good idea or a bad idea? You know, as you were saying that, I was actually desperately looking for uh, examples of companies or things that took advantage uh, of another competitor or company leaving that space. Oh, interesting. It's literally yeah. just, 
it just took over. Um, for whatever reason, my I completely blanked and couldn't think of a single one. I know for sure I'll think of something right after we stop recording. But uh, this is a brilliant idea. I think the first time you pitched it to me, I thought it was ridiculous. Actually, it was a text message you sent me in the middle of the night. And uh, it's like, what's wrong with this, what's this guy? But, no, uh, you, you said, Jim, it's... this is the opposite direction we want to be going. I was like, oh, you're probably right. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, like if you think about it, it's you want bigger companies that have higher, but bigger budgets, um, like more established product market fits that are easier to work with, quite frankly. Um, but I think this is a, maybe like once in a, I wouldn't say once in a lifetime, but definitely like once in a generation opportunity where there's something that everyone was like, that played a big role in the community that was the the center of the startup community and suddenly decided to leave and uh, or close down in this case. And you, because of your experience, seven years mentoring with tech stars have, an, have like not only history, but also connections in the local ecosystem. And there's just so much demand for it. Even and I think it's easy and it's a very low risk experiment. Like if you're trying to test it to see if, you know, that you could you know capture the demand and the anticipation around it. I think it would be there's no downside. And if it works, though, it could be a complete game changer, right? So the you would essentially become the thought leader, the person around it, the person who who revived the you know the startup accelerator in whatever fashion. Um, and you could bring back a lot of the mentors and the people that previously worked with tech stars. So. I think it has enormous upside opportunity. It's really exciting. Um, the only fear that I have in mind is just the the bandwidth that it requires and demands. I don't think this is a simple, uh, let's just you know throw something up and see what happens. It, it requires a lot of your time and attention. And that's the only thing that I fear. Um, like you're running growth and then at the same time trying to do that, uh, it'll be very demanding on you and, and the rest of the team for that matter. But besides that, I think it's, it's a killer opportunity. And... If and I know for sure if you saw someone else doing it, you're going to get really angry because you feel that was my <laughs> idea, it was a fair opportunity, and I don't and, and I don't want you to say it's Jonathan who talked me out of it. So it's definitely something that that's worth pursuing. Um, and the upside is too huge to to ignore. The hand you hold holds you down. You're holding me back. No, um, just yeah. like when we see someone launching as the incentive guy and they become a New York Times bestseller and crush it, or I'm gonna be like yeah. Jonathan told you you should have done that. Um, but I think the real question here is opportunity cost, right? Because yeah. we've got growth it. It's like stop and just focus on that. It's like, oh, we also acquired need. Well, you and I did just buy a domain. You are actually spinning off and starting a company. We'll be talking about here in a little bit that I want to be helping and be a part of. There's other things we could be doing. And it's it's almost like you need to create this spreadsheet and list out your ideas, go like risk reward like upside potential, what brings you joy, honestly, using some of like the 17 things from this blog post to evaluate where you put your time, because um, I think spreading yourself too thin is just a, a kiss of death. And that's something that I'm very guilty of. You know, worst case scenario, if this was just a marketing stunt and something done just to capture people's attention and imagination, and then it just like fizzled out, I still think that'd be a huge win. You could still put that on your CV. You could be the person who tried to revive tech stars in Seattle. So there's very little downside. You don't have to see this one through uh, mm -hmm. to get a lot of the juice from from that experience. So yeah. um, I still think it's just worth it. Yeah, we can, it's also like, you know, I complain like, oh, I can't do all these things. And there's people that Andrew Wilkinson own 80 companies. There's Mark Sims, who's a, a part of like 15 companies. It's like, oh, there's a world where you can delegate and leverage other people's skills and talents to run things kind of goes back to the point on like superstars are more valuable than they seem so yeah i, th yeah. I think that's where, where the head needs to go yeah so awesome thanks man cool thanks jim have a good one bye yeah.